good. Probably words or parts of words that you have uttered once or twice or many times after you've indulged in a delicious meal. I know that oftentimes I have a favorite meal that comes to my mind when I think of that phrase, mm good. And not just a favorite meal, but a favorite preparer of that meal. For, as many of you know, I went to undergraduate away from home. And so I always looked forward to coming home and having my mom's lasagna. In fact, I would get into the car, I would be on my way, and I was already thinking about the smell of it in the oven. I could nearly taste it in my mouth. I could picture the cheese, the sauce, the meat, the ricotta melting in my mouth in perfect sync. Are you a little hungry? Mm. I'm sure there are meals like that that come to your mind as well, that you just cannot help but say, "Mm mm-mm, good. And as you think about those meals, you know that those meals are probably ones that you'll sit down and you'll start out and you'll have the best of intentions of eating just a small portion. But by the end, you're leaning back in your chair, you're loosening your belt up a little bit, and you're saying, "Mm." well, you probably wouldn't say that. If all you had was some dry bread and some cold fish, would you? uh, Is that anybody's favorite food? No, probably not. When we picture a meal that we would have fish and bread, we want something with a nice sauce or something that's nice and warm. We want it to be delicious. We wouldn't wouldn't look at that meal and say, boy, I would love some cold fish and some dry bread. Maybe a sandwich. Maybe a sardine sandwich or a tuna fish sandwich. But we wouldn't say that's a wonderful dinner. We wouldn't picture that as that delicacy that would be fit for us as kings and queens. No. But imagine if you were quite hungry. Imagine if it was the first meal that you were eating all day, all day long. You had been sitting there or working hard, and you had not eaten. Dry bread and cold fish don't sound so bad then, do they? And this is where we pick up in our gospel reading today from Matthew. In Matthew chapter 14, here we have people who have been sitting all day long. They have been sitting there listening to Jesus. Their bellies maybe are not full, but they have been filled up with spiritual food. They have been chowing down on that message. And they have probably heard Jesus say before in Matthew 4 that bread is not the most important thing. You probably know this verse. That it, Nobody knows it? Well, I thought I'd try it anyway. Matthew 4 talks about that it is not the f- food, but it is the word of God that fills us up, right? Does that sound familiar as you're remembering now? That it is, that it is not simple bread, but, f- but the word. Well, even knowing that, they were probably hungry. As they sat there, and we know that it was starting to become evening, that it was already late at night, and they were sitting there, and well, not late at night, but late in the afternoon. So even if they were able to go home or run to, to the supermarket, which they didn't have 24-hour supermarkets, well, they probably wouldn't have got there in time. So Jesus does a miracle. He provides them food. And not just enough food, but more than enough food. But you know this, don't you? You know this because if you've ever read any one of the Gospels, It's printed there. In fact, it's the miracle that is printed in all four of the Gospels. You know that every couple of years that someone's going to be standing here, if it's not me, but at least a preacher is going to have this text come up at least once every couple of years. So it's almost like when you hear the Christmas story. You can recite the the feeding of the 5,000 from memory. It's like the, or, or the Easter story. You can run along with Peter and John as they go to the tomb, and you could be sitting there with the people on the side of the hill hearing the message. But so what does this have to do with us? What does this miracle have to do with us? Why, why are we reading it again? No, can we end it right here? We've heard about 500 sermons on this already, right? Well, I think there's still a message for us here today. I think there's a message that God is sharing through his scripture for each of us as he speaks to us today. Now, sometimes when people have read this miracle, they've interpreted it as a miracle about sharing. They've said, well, they remember in John chapter 6, oh, that's right, there was a little boy, and that was his lunch, right? That was maybe his only meal for the day, and he was the one who shared it. And so we immediately say, ah, this miracle is about sharing. Wouldn't it be great if all of us would share just like that little boy? The youth of today would share their lunches with other people. Wouldn't it be great if we would give up our flat screen TVs, our new cars, our new houses, our new clothes, and our fine meals for other people? There wouldn't be so many hungry people in Africa, right? So sharing is a good thing. But that's not what this miracle is about. This miracle isn't about sharing. Now, that, it, like I said, it's a good thing. 
We are certainly called to share with others, to give to others, to provide for others. That's part of the reason we have a food bank. That's part of the reason that we help those in need is because we follow Jesus' example. But that's not what this miracle is about. Other people, including myself, have looked at this miracle and they've, and they've got caught up in the very first word, or second word, but the, very, the second word, the first verse there, that Jesus had splagnizomai on the people. You maybe know this word, but if your Greek's a bit rusty, splagnizomai, it is compassion. It is heartfelt love for others. Well, for them, it was bowel-felt love for others, but it is our same understanding of Christ's love from the very center of us. And so, those who, so there are those who have read this miracle and said this is about God's love. Not such a bad thought. Isn't most of the scripture about God's love for us? Isn't that what he shows us in his death on the cross, his great love for us? But again, I think that we're, that we're being a little hasty here. Because while well, God does show his love, he does so in a different way, at least in this particular occasion. Did you notice what immediately followed after that? If you look back at your bulletin for a moment, you'll notice that immediately he had compassion on them in the midst of his sadness, in the midst of his suffering, mourning the loss of John. He had compassion and he healed their sick. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He gave speech to the mute. He gave walking, allowed the lame to walk. That was how he showed his compassion. So what is this miracle about? Well, it does remind us of God's love for us. It does remind us of his constant provision for us. But is that what the message is? What we have to do is we have to look at Matthew 14, where this came from. We have to look at Matthew 14. We have to look at all of the the gospel of Matthew to realize that this miracle isn't just about sharing. It's not just about compassion. Yes, those are elements of it. But that is not the main point. We have to look at this, this, at this miracle in the, in the context that it was originally given. If you look at Matthew 14, you'll notice immediately for, before that, you have the retelling of the death of John, his execution, Jesus' own cousin, certainly something that would be weighing on his heart. He, gets all, he goes off to a quiet place, but not to run, not to get away from, from those who might want to capture, capture him, but to be to mourn. Immediately following this feeding of the 5,000, after he does this great miracle, he does another great miracle. He walks on the water. So far, maybe you're not seeing the connection. Well, let's look at the broader context of Matthew. Let's look at Matthew in general. Now, Matthew, if you remember, was written to a crowd of Jewish converts. These were people who were waiting for who? The Messiah, right? They were waiting for the Messiah, the anointed one of Israel that had been promised since Genesis chapter 3. These were people who had been waiting their whole lives, whose parents had been waiting their whole lives, whose parents, parents, parents had been waiting their whole life for the Messiah. And so John, so Matthew is revealing to them that the Messiah has come. The Messiah has come and he has conquered death. The Messiah has come and he is not just, that he is not just any person, any man. But this anointed one is God himself. God himself who took on human form. And so when we see Matthew chapter 14, when we look at the broader context of Matthew, we see that Matthew is showing us our Savior. He is showing us that our God came to us in a fleshly form. He came to us incarnate. That he came to us and he did miracles among among us to show us his power. Show us that he was not just like God. He was not just a part of God, a form of God. He was not just a a look-alike. But He is God among us. When Jesus fed those 5,000 people, He showed to them that He was God. That creation was under His command. That although He had taken on human form, He had not given up His godliness. And He couldn't. He couldn't give up His godliness. Because as we read further along, all of a sudden we get a little bit further into Matthew. And we see that Jesus was taken and He was crucified for our sins. And not just anybody could do that, could they? It had to be God himself. Because we are imperfect. We are sinful people. We are people who have broken God's law time and again. We could not die on the cross for ourselves. We could not give our lives for ourselves. But God could. Jesus Christ, our Savior, could. He could give his life that we might have life. This miracle shows us that God, that God came. Every week, well, almost every week, 
we confess the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, don't we? And in the Nicene Creed, we say that phrase time and again, don't we? One substance with the Father. So important for us to know that. So important for us to remember that it is God. That Jesus Christ, 100% man, 100% God gave His life for us. 100% man had to take our place. 100% God had to be sinless and holy. And in that feeding, He showed 100% God. As He walked on the water right after this, He showed that nature, that all creation was under His control. He showed that He was powerful enough to defeat death. Now here's the Lutheran side of me coming out a little bit. But I don't think you could miss this. But Did you notice right there at the end? We heard a very familiar phrase. Used a little out of context for us, but, but, in Matthew, but in Matthew 14 we see right at the end, as He was breaking those loaves of bread, He blessed them, didn't He? Well, I don't know about you, but like I said, as the Lutheran in me comes out, I cannot help but see the parallel with the Lord's Supper there. I cannot help but look and see that, again, we see the God's provision for us, that we see not only did He come and take care of our needs and and our spiritual needs in that way, but He continues to take care of them each day. He continues to, every time we come to that rail, every time we go up to communion and receive God's precious gift of His supper, His body and blood, we are again receiving that sustenance. We are receiving that strengthening of faith. We are receiving Him a gift to us what a gift to us as as he gives himself to us his own body and blood as he breaks that bread for us we are reminded of that last supper as he broke that bread for the people they didn't know it was yet to come but for them they saw that god's provision was there and so it is not just a spiritual provision though but as we do say each day in the lord's prayer give us this day our daily bread we're not, only, we're not only lifting up to God our prayers for, for food or even for bread, but, but for all of our needs, aren't we? We know that our most important need was His death on the cross and His payment for our sins. But even beyond that, that He gave, that He gives to us beyond that, our needs, physical, our emotional needs each day. And sometimes He does it in strange ways, doesn't He? He does it in ways that we don't expect. Would you have expected Him to feed 5,000 people by breaking five loaves and two fish? Well, maybe because now you've read the, par- the miracle about 300 times, but, but if you were a person originally sitting there, you wouldn't have expected it, would you? In the same way, He takes care of us each day in ways that we never expect. He takes care of us in ways that, that, that surprise us. Sometimes, have you ever been having a bad day? You've been down and out, and God just happens to send to you that one person who smiles, who says, Has a gr- have a great day, and actually means it. Have you ever been trying to balance the checkbook? And you've been looking and you're trying to line up the numbers. I know this uh, happened to Carla and I several times when we were in college. We were trying to line up the numbers and they just didn't line up. And then out of nowhere, God provided us what we needed. See, God does it in ways we don't expect, doesn't he? He does it in ways that, that reassure us that it is him. That he's the one providing for us. That he's the one caring for us. He's the one who's sustaining us each day. He's the one who's created us. He's the one who invites us to come to Him. When we're thirsty, when we're weak, when we're hungry, to come to Him. To be filled up and to be made full. And that sustenance is there each day. Each and every day until the last day. And this is the really beautiful part. Because on the last day is when he's going, we are going to break bread with Him at the marriage feast. On the last day is when we are going to sit in His presence. And He is going to break bread and He's going to bless that bread. And we are going to taste and see that the Lord is good. Truly, a meal fit for a king. A meal prepared by the king for us, his children. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have sent your son Jesus, true God and true man, to conquer death for us. We thank you that he cares for us each day and he sustains us each day. We thank you that you have shown your power among us. Help us each day, Lord, to see this power anew. Help us each day to rely on you for that sustenance, for that care. Help us each day to know that as you are true God, that you are powerful enough to defeat our enemies, sin, death, and the devil. Lord, send us forth with this message, this message of hope and this comfort, to know, knowing that there are many people who hunger and thirst and that you are the only one who can quench that hunger.
quench that thirst. Lord, send us forth from here, carrying this good news that we are redeemed children of you, who will one day join with you in the marriage feast that has no end. And may your peace, which transcends all understanding, now guard our hearts and minds. Amen.